Sup y'all, it's me, it's your boy, back here in week two of the cup. Starting off strong, we have uh, Weed Gang versus the Shadow Scarabs. We got one of the lowest strength teams in the entire game versus one of the bashiest, most durable teams in the entire game. So that should be pretty interesting to, uh, to watch. You can see it was a 0-3 victory for the Kemri here. So uh, clearly it didn't go very well for the Goblin player, but... We'll see if there's some ways uh, that we can improve on that and hopefully make it better in the in the next match. Uh, I don't think I have anything to cover here in terms of new players. You, you know what? No, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. Let's take a look at the goblins real quick because I want to talk about something you can do when you are facing uh, a very high strength kind of slow team like this as the goblin team. Let me just make one real quick. So if we go... And look at the goblin players. Let's put a random name here. All right. Now I said before the goblins have a lot of positionals. They have their main goblin linemen and their trolls. Those are their two kind of just normal players. But the rest are their positional players. I'm not going to worry about the pug order right now because that's not relevant to this match. Uh, we, we've already talked about the Looney and the Fnatic, which are two pretty important players, but when you're playing the Goblins, again, considering that a lot of your characters, uh, a lot of your players, that is, are going to have two strength aside from your trolls, one of the things that could be difficult to play against is something like the Kemri or uh, maybe the Dwarves, these teams that are really going to heavily rely on cage tactics, where they're going to have their ball carriers surrounded by some higher strength uh, supporting players to stop you from getting in and getting the ball away from them. And a player that can come in handy in these situations is the Bombardier. Now you can get this as a player on your Goblin team, uh, just right off the bat, have them on your team. Uh, there's also a star player that pretty much anybody can hire. I think almost anyone, if not everyone, can hire uh, the Bombardier character. Bomber Dribble Snot, I believe is his name. And I wanna say he's like, Oh, I don't know, probably around 100k, something like that, maybe a little bit less, I'm not sure. Uh, you would get him in the inducement phase. Anyway, the important thing to know here about the Bombardier is that, uh, well, he has bombs. So how does that work? Uh, basically, instead of uh, making a pass every turn, you could just choose to throw a bomb somewhere on the field that's still within your passing range. Uh, if you fail the passing roll, it's going to land right next to you and it's going to explode. Uh, if you succeed in the passing roll, it's going to land wherever you threw it. Now, this bomb can be caught, and if it is caught by a player, they can pass it to another location to try and kind of play hot potato with it. Uh, but eventually, this bomb is going to hit the ground and it's going to go off. And in the space that it lands and all the spaces adjacent to it, everybody basically immediately rolls for an armor break. Uh, that's pretty much the gist of what's being said here. I think, I don't remember if it's an unmodified armor break. Let's see if I can just skim through this here. Da, 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 da. Uh, this is treated as a normal pass, by the way. You can use any kind of like passing related skills for this, which is pretty nice. Uh, when the bomb finally explodes, any player in the same score is knocked down, and players in adjacent squares are knocked down on a roll of 4 plus. So. If you knock them down, you just make your armor roll. But the point is, you can easily hit multiple players at once with this bomb, which is really good when you throw it into the middle of a cage of a bunch of very low agility skeletons and mummies that are not able to uh, do anything about it. Next thing you know, they're all on the ground. You can go steal the ball and do whatever you want. It's pretty nice. That being said, unfortunately, uh, the Goblin player was not able to start a match with a Bombardier. Uh, not that I would have expected them to anyway because their team value was already up there and they didn't really have the money for one So I'm not saying this is you know uh, a, a missed opportunity or anything I'm just saying that in the future if you're trying to play a goblin team and you go up against a, a team like the Kemri or the dwarves or something uh, A team that's going to be playing like that uh, th This can always be a good player to get and this goes for uh, any team. Honestly, you don't need to be uh, a goblin like I said to get the bombardier star player Pretty much anybody can grab him. So if you think that you're going to have difficulty against that kind of team, you might want to consider buying one of these guys. Uh, aside from that, nothing to talk about with the teams. They haven't changed since the last week. So we'll go ahead and just get right into the replay. 
Okay, here we are, start of the round. Uh, I went ahead and waited for the first kick here because I don't think there's too much to talk about with the formations. Goblins going for a widespread using their tackle zones. Uh, player has gone ahead and put the trolls on the sides here to kind of give them a wide berth from the fanatic, keeping in mind that the fanatic can hit your allies, so you normally don't want to have any kind of uh, any allied players near them since you can't really control their movement. Uh, but also making sure that there's a goblin standing next to either of the trolls, that they have a handler to mitigate that really stupid debuff, which is uh, a good move. So, uh, all in all here, seeing that goblins are playing defense, this is a good starting formation in my opinion. Uh, you can look here at the response from the Kemri player. All three mummies run on the front of the field. We got some skeletons on the sidelines and the, the blitzers right behind the mummies. And it looks like there is a throw rod now in the back. I believe the throw rod is a new purchase from the last match for the Kemri. Uh, throw rod, I will get to in a moment. They're not particularly special. Uh, despite their name, they're not much of a thrower because Kemri just can't really throw that well at all. But they are the best suited on the team for picking up the ball and typically ends up becoming the ball carrier for the team. So... Uh, there, there's nothing particularly special going on there otherwise. Now, uh, as the Kemri, you feel inclined to uh, put your mummies and a lot of your players on the center of the field to try and kind of have this dominance, but even though you have these mummies with five strength, I think because of the fanatic, you're just kind of outclassed here. Uh, your chances are you're not going to be able to secure the middle, and this is the case for uh, a lot of teams when it comes to playing against a Fnatic. You kind of just have to give up the middle. So I think it possibly would have been a better idea to just kind of, you know, give it up. Put, a, put a, some skeleton linemen on the line, keep your mummies freed up so you can move them elsewhere. I mean, maybe having them over here counteracting the trolls is still a good move. Maybe more in the corners, like right in front of them. But um, I think the blitzers and the mummy in the middle here are probably uh, not the best use. Uh, especially considering that you're going to be, um, you know, receiving the first kick. I like to have my blitzers on the side, personally, because they're usually the best suited to kind of diving in and going for those first hits to open a way for the ball carrier. So unless you're a team that's like really focused on making that center play, I think it's good to have your blitzers on the side when you're going offense. Anyway, the first kick went off and we had a randomly assigned injury, which went to Deddy Izzard. I believe that's just a lineman uh, saved by the thick skull perk. Uh, by the way, if you don't know, whenever you see a skill pop up like this, uh, that means that the skill actually took effect uh, and, and changed the results. So this would have been a knockout, uh, but because... Deddy Izzard has Thick Skull, it's turned into a stun instead, so that's why it says it right there. Anyway, let's see where the kick lands. And unfortunately, it's the touchback. Goes ahead and gives the ball to the throw bra anyway. Uh, that's alright. Again, I think if the Blitzers were on the side, you could have given the ball to a Blitzer, and that probably would have been a better decision, but... This is how it goes. Moving the ball to the center of the field, again, I don't think this is the move. I think you're going to have a lot of trouble taking that Fnatic down, but who knows. Personally, if I'm up against a Fnatic, I would just avoid it at all costs rather than trying to uh, fight against it. I just don't really think it works that well. Because right now, it's going to be taking a Mummy and both Blitzers to get a one-die roll against that Fnatic. And do you really want to try and make a one-die roll work on a Mummy? I don't know. Well, now it's going to be a two-die roll, so... Oh, no, it's still a one-die roll. Ah, because there's a goblin here that's marking that lineman. That's why. One-die roll with the troll. Hits a mummy. Pretty good. Knocks him down. Goblins could probably start flanking around and trying to envelop the ball carrier here. Instead of moving back to counteract the center... I would definitely be moving your side goblins in and around. The sooner that you can surround that ball carrier, the easier time you're going to have, I think. Starts moving the Fnatic, gets a hit on a mummy. Very nice. Moves back, unfortunately. Gets another hit on a lineman. You can already see the Fnatic just knocks people around. Oh, double skulls. Rerolls, gets a hit. Very nice. Three hits in one turn. That's the kind of value you get with the Fnatic, especially when the enemy team kind of just plays into it, so... And those are all potential armor breaks. Mummy stands back up and takes out the troll. 
just a stun though. And you can see that the Kenry player is now trying to form and advance the cage. See, you could have already gotten those goblins in there and on the ball carrier, and this would be a little bit harder for the Kenry to deal with. Move two on the right side in to start flanking around, move two on the left to flank around, have the rest cover the center. Would have uh, pretty much halted the Kenry advance there. But we'll see how this goes. Gets another hit with a mummy. Again, once... Just one stun. Okay. Starts with the dodges. Moving the fanatic around, seeing if he can clear the way out. Alright, busting the cage open with the fanatic. Very nice. Gets another hit on the blitzer. It's the ball carrier, just a push though, but now the ball carrier is outside of the cage, you can... Oh no! I failed going for a roll! Ah! Yeah, that's, that's really unfortunate there. That is unfortunate. So, if you in any way get knocked down with your Fnatic, it is a guaranteed knockout, uh, if not an injury. So, it is... A lot more dangerous to be making going for it rolls and it's a lot more imperative that you avoid hitting yourself with bad dice as well when you're using that character uh, because once they go down once they're just gone so it's it's a dangerous game making a going for it roll there it's unfortunate too because i don't really think that was necessary you already had the fanatic in the middle of the player base here you could have moved some goblins around to start marking so that they wouldn't get assists on the Fnatic as well. I think he had a good position there, and, and yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm noticing in this league from multiple teams, uh, granted, a lot of people are newer players, so you wouldn't know this, but as I've said, uh, try not to make going for it rolls unless you need to, right? Uh, d don't, don't just make them because you can. Wait to make them if it's going to be like a now or never kind of situation because you're going to keep screwing yourself over by getting those uh those going for it rolls that just end up failing and uh it's not fun anyway coming back to it ball carrier moved to the center of the field fanatic's gone now so it should be pretty easy for them to secure dominance here forming a very tight cage now this is kind of dangerous when you have too many people in a cage here because it becomes very easy to uh, push a player in and knock the ball carrier out. For instance, if you were to hit the mummy here, granted the mummy is going to be the hardest one to hit, but if you were to hit him on a diagonal, you could push the ball carrier to either of these two spaces, putting him outside the cage and in a much more vulnerable position than he otherwise would be in. So uh, something to keep in mind when you're forming your cage, you usually don't want to stack too many players on the ball carrier. Four is usually a good number. I, I really wouldn't do more than that. I don't think there's any reason to. Uh, because that's when you start to negate the usefulness of your cage. It's also a little bit of an overcommitment with your players because you don't have them to secure enemy players elsewhere on the pitch, and it makes it a little bit difficult for you to stop them from reinforcing. Throw Ross, uh, <laughs> sorry, Deddy Izzard Skeleton back here still hasn't stood up. I don't think the Camry player has noticed. Now, what I'm noticing is the goblins are playing a little bit too much to the front of the cage and ideally you want to be enveloping the cage wrap around them and surround them because then they're not going to be able to get optimal marks which means that it's going to be harder for them to get hits whereas you have the advantage it can mark optimally a lot easier And this cage is just going to inch up every turn. It ends up becoming a battle of attrition when you're doing stuff like this. The other thing is when you're stopping uh, slow moving cages like this, you don't want to have your characters right up on top of them in the front. Always try and keep them a space back when you're lower strength like this. Use the distance to your advantage. Make them come to you. Because now you can see that the Camry player is getting like four or five free hits this turn. And you could have easily limited that down to one hit just by having your players one step back. That screening strategy is critical uh, when you are playing a lower strength team or a more vulnerable team like this against a higher strength team. You need to limit the amount of hits that they're able to make every turn. Mm. 
Ah, unfortunate on the really stupid procs. Yeah, see, like, moving this goblin in here, uh, sure, it's marking more players, but since all these guys easily outstrength you, you're just giving a free hit to the Kemri player. If you, if you just keep a player back one space, it, it's a lot more viable. Your right, ball carrier moving out of the cage to the flank. Goblins are too consolidated in the center, so they're not able to really uh, stop him from doing that. Starts to reform the cage on the right side of the field. Camry player's left side of the field. Now there is a troll right there, but he's on the ground and he's really stupid, so it's unlikely he's really going to do anything unless a goblin comes and backs him up. Actually, real quick, I just want to go back. And once again, just give an example. Uh, if you were able to take a bomber in this situation before the ball carrier moved over, that would have been a prime time to toss a bomb in. You could easily knock down five, six players if you're lucky, you know? Uh, that would have been a devastating opportunity for the goblins. So, uh, again, unfortunately, I don't think the goblin player was actually able, able to bring a bomber in this situation. Uh, so I can't fault them for that. But uh, for anybody else who might be playing against a team like this, uh, something to think about for sure. All right, like I said, we're going back and forming a new cage around the ball, getting some hits on the goblins with the mummies. I think we already have one or two injured goblins, but that's kind of a given when it comes to... Uh, Playing against teams like this, seven armor, no strength, they're just all going to get injured. Goblins are expendable, that's the idea, they're very cheap. Now, of course, the thing is, you want to be making these trades, at least if you're the goblin player, you want to be making these trades on your own terms, rather than uh, on the enemy's terms. Alright, moving the players in front of the cage, very good. Yeah, this right here is perfect. This is... I the exact kind of strategy you want to have. Okay, I, I would have moved... Wait, hold on, let's see if he does it. No, okay. So I imagine he did this because uh, he's trying to kind of cover this gap a little bit. But th this strategy here is, is pretty much perfect. This is what you want to be doing like every single turn when you're playing a team uh, heavy defense like goblin team like this against a team that you can't really fight head on one step back columns of two because now let's just say that um you know if, if you only had one goblin here the carry player could easily take the blitzer i'm gonna just move forward a little bit to get this message off the screen so it's easier to look at okay let's say there were, that this is the only goblin that was here the Camry team would very be easily be able to take this blitzer, move him here, knock that goblin to the side. Next thing you know, this guy could just run up the side of the field and gain more space. So you effectively did nothing with the one goblin. But because you have this column of two, you can only hit the goblin in front, and then the other goblin is still backing up and covering these spaces here so that he can't advance. This is why this uh, strategy of having two players in columns spaced out like this is so strong against these slow, bashy teams, because they only get one blitz per turn, and they need to use that blitz in the most important location possible, and you're just depriving them of options. Now, unfortunately in this case, the blitzer could actually move right here, knock this goblin out of the way, and just run through the middle, uh, because it's not this double column strategy, but... I imagine what the Goblin player was trying to do here was put one guy here to kind of cover this gap. The The Goblin coach was low on players on the last turn, so this is understandable. Uh, but I like this. It, it's, it's the right idea. And if you can be doing this every turn, you should be doing it every turn, because that's exactly what you want. See so yeah, how the Kermit player responds. Moves up one. Goes for the Blitz. Yeah, not really the target. Like I said, having a blitzer hit this one that way uh, would have made it very easy for you to just run up the middle. There would have been a gap. Of course, then you probably wouldn't have been able to remake your cage. Um, and you do have a few turns as the Kenry player here, so maybe 
don't really need to focus on rushing the ball to the end zone like that, but it's definitely the, the vulnerability that I'm noticing anyway. Moving up, and you see how the carry player has to just like line up all the players marking every turn when they're standing farther away like that. Got to move all of his players up and hope that those players are still there on the next turn for the hit, which they likely will not be. When these goblins have stunty and dodge, I mean, it, uh, they can just move most of the time wherever they want. Not all the time, unfortunately. Let's just rewind that real quick. So, I want to talk about a slight missed opportunity here. So, what just happened uh, before the turnover that the Goblin player has here, the coach opts to stand this player up and then try to make a move with this troll. And then unfortunately, the troll gets the really stupid debuff and can't do anything. Now, the troll has four movements, so this is a little bit tricky. But I would say that in the given situation, you're kind of running out of room to screen with, and obviously, as we know, the Goblin player is unfortunately about to have one of their players trip, causing a turnover. Uh, what I would have done here is actually stand this Goblin up and then move them over to the troll so that this troll had only uh, a 17% chance of getting the really stupid debuff. And then there would have been the potential to move the diagonally a couple spaces and go for a blitz. Now, you would have had to make a couple going for it rolls, so who knows, it probably wouldn't have worked out anyway. But there is that vulnerability on the enemy ball carrier here. And considering that's a 5 strength troll hitting a 3 strength throw raw. I mean, it's it's pretty much guaranteed that you're going to knock him down. Uh, and if not knock him down, you're at least going to be right on his ass, right? So uh, I, I would have done that first. You got to remember uh, with big guys is that depending on the big guy, most of them need a little bit of help. They need somebody right next to them helping them out or some kind of special modifier. So... Make sure that you are trying to uh, reduce the odds that they're going to be getting this debuff as often as you can when you want to use them. Because 50% every turn for that really stupid debuff, it's, it's just not fun. Anyway, we go back here and we'll see just a couple of dodges once again from the Goblin Coach. Unfortunately, trips. I imagine we're just going to watch the Kemri kind of force their way through here. They only have two turns left. Goes for a hit with the mummy. Only a push. Hit with the blitzer. Only going to be a push. Needs to open up a hole in the line here. Goes for a blitz. And there it is. Now the ball carrier can just walk on through. Oh, ooh, that's scary, though. Still goes for a hit with the mummy. Granted, that was three dice. That's a very, very low chance that you're going to fail when you have a team reroll like that, but still a scary roll to get three skulls. Camry just slowly advancing that death march that will not be stopped. This is the whole MO of Camry, is you just get the ball, you make a really solid cage, and you keep moving forward. It just turns into a battle of attrition, really. Eventually, you'll make it through. The reality of defense in Blood Bowl is that when you're uh, doing this kind of strategy, eventually the defense is going to fail. You're basically just waiting for the opportunity to hit the ball carrier and switch it into an offensive play, because... If you play into defense the entire half, eventually the enemy team is going to push you too far and you're going to suffer too many hits and you're just going to end up uh, having a, an enemy touchdown on your hands. But there's not always a whole lot you can do about that, especially at this point, so many players off the field. And this is a, a uh, this is a tough nut to crack here as goblins as well. Low strength makes it really difficult to play this team. And that's going to be our first touchdown on turn 8.
Barry White. That's a great name. Alright, one of the Goblin players wakes back up. Alright, so before we look at the formations here, I just want to talk about a couple things. First off, I want to make the comment, uh, Barry White, the thrower, love the name. Uh, why did you still spell it W-H-I-T-E when you could have gone W-I-G-H-T? That would have been a lot funnier. Um, missed opportunity. And I'm going to be docking a few points from the leak for that. Uh, if you're going to make a pun, you should do a good job. Anyway, aside from that, uh, if you look here at the Goblin team, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 players on the field right now. And we have two that are injured and in the dugout there. Now, the Fanatic would normally be a uh, red card off the field right now, but since he's already injured, uh, the ref did not bother. However, unfortunately for the Goblin player, one of the other players that he had to fill in the gaps was the Looney, who is also a secret weapon player. And unfortunately for the Goblin player, he doesn't have any other extra players right now, which means that he can't take the Looney off the field. And seeing that there's only a one turn left in this half, that means that Looney is going to get one turn on the field and then he's going to get red carded, which is very, very sad indeed. So not going to worry too much about the formations here because like I said, it's, it's the final turn of the half anyway, not of the match. Uh, now in FYI, if you are the Camry player in this position where you are going to not have a turn to actually do anything, uh, chances are you just want to avoid getting hit. So you can just move all of your players into your own end zone where they're out of reach of the enemy team and then just leave a couple linemen on the field. That way you avoid a random blitz or something. Are you going to get hurt? Are you going to get injured if you don't do that? Not necessarily, but I mean, a Blood Bowl, you never really know. So, if you want to play it safe, put all your important characters in the end zone. Because who knows, that uh, that Looney could blitz a mummy right now and get a get an injury. David Boney suffers an injury. Ooh, an actual injury, too. Unfortunate. No long-term effect. Does he regen? Nope. Oh, that sucks. For the Camry player. Goes for a blitz with the chainsaw, gets the hit. Fortunately, just a stun. Those Camry are durable. Goes to pick up the ball. Didn't really need to, I guess. Fortunately, turnover, and that's the end of the half. Gonna go ahead and skip through this. And there's the loony off the field. Very sad. All right, started the second half. 10 players on the Camry team and 10 players on the Goblin team. But the Goblins no longer have their secret weapons. So it's gonna take a lot of precise marking of enemy players to really make this work. It looks like the Goblins are gonna be going first. They're receiving at the beginning of this half. Very front-loaded, have all their goblins right on the line scrimmage. I guess you're going to go for early hits. Ooh, and it's a blitz. Unfortunate, that means that the Shadow Scarabs, the Kemri team, gets one free turn. It's a normal turn for every player except those in a tackle zone, which means there's a blitz. And that's a hit. Aside from that, you can move all of your players normally. Ball is has not landed yet, makes the going for it roll, fails. Goes for a re-roll. Fails again. Probably didn't really need to make a going for a roll there. Kind of a waste of a blitz. Goes for a pass. Unfortunately, because of the stunty modifier on goblins, they're actually pretty bad at passing. But he does get it. 
and fails the catch, unfortunately. But it does move the ball up the field. Yeah, goblins are unfortunately just not very good at passing. Yeah, the stunty modifier, while it makes it easier for them to dodge, it applies that same penalty to all of your passing rolls instead. Uh, granted, everybody has three agi, so they're not that great at catching either. It's really just kind of get a hold of the ball and start running with it. Camry player just going for hits and moving the team to the left side of the field, getting ready to secure the ball. And I imagine you're going to line up some hits here and just hit every adjacent goblin. Easy pick up with the throw raw, because he's got sure hands. Sure hands and pass. Not that you're going to be passing to any of your other players on the Camry team. They just can't catch. Now you can see the Kenry player once again has immediately started going for that cage. Once the Kenry player gets the cage going, it's very hard to break it, especially if the mummies are involved. Dodge with the troll. Unfortunately, that just that one was not going to happen. When it comes to big guys like trolls, really, if they have a player on them, you just need to hit them. Now, if you get break tackle as a skill on one of your players, you can make the occasional dodge like that, but um, it's usually not the best skill to take on a big guy. Not not one of the first skills anyway. You probably want to wait uh, until you level up a couple times first. Get, you know, a couple other things. And already we see this death march starting in. Just the slow advance of the cage, one space at a time. And all these goblin players are still marked, so it's just easy hits for the Kemri player. So real quick, I uh, I talked about this in the last match uh, with the orcs versus uh, the Skaven. But I might as well bring it up here again, so because this is a team that's more suited for this kind of strategy. So as I said before, when you have your enemy kind of making a cage like this, having a bombardier on your team can be really useful for breaking it. But another thing that you can do, uh, especially as a goblin team or a halfling team or an ogre team, any team that has a big guy that's capable of throwing teammates uh, and has a lot of very cheap, uh, expendable players like these goblins these goblins are like 40k i think which is very cheap in the grand scheme of things uh you can always have your troll pick up a goblin and try to toss it at the ball carrier because uh, as i said in the last video if you fail a throw teammate pass or you throw that teammate and they get hurt they fail to land whatever it does not count as a turnover unless they were holding the ball which means that you can use them as live artillery and you can throw them right into the middle of uh, the opponent's players and it basically counts as a both down result in which uh, you just roll an armor check on both players uh, and that can be really nice for kind of like busting open the cage a little bit and uh, making an entry point for the rest of your players so uh, it would be cool if we got to see some of that in the league at some point although I think there's only a couple teams that we have in the leagues that are capable of doing that it would be it would be this team, the Goblins, and then both Orc teams. And unfortunately, I believe those are the only teams that can do it. So, But again, that's just another strategy you have at your disposal. Because you, like an important thing to understand when you have the, these low strength teams is that your players are worth nowhere near as much as the enemy players are. So any opportunity for you to get a trade with another player is really nice. Because you are putting up uh, much less team value than they are. Now, once again, I like what you're doing here. Again, in front of the cage, having that one step back, that's ideal. But this right here, space them out, make those columns of two players. It's much more effective than making a line like this. And you don't have to commit as many players to it. Mummy hits the troll. 
Unfortunately, it's a KO. And since all these goblins are on the left side of the field now, the rest of the Camry players can just move up the center without any kind of contention. Knocks one goblin out of the way. And now the ball carrier can just run up the diagonal. Still gonna have to make one dodge because of this goblin. Let's see. Oh, it decides to go around instead. Okay, that's probably why. If it weren't for that one goblin, you could just cut right through. But you see all the Camry players are spaced out because you have to use those tackle zones to your advantage. You don't need to have uh, your, your, your players stacked up on one another like that unless you're trying to mark for uh, a hit. And again, it worked out here, but if you're going to move the troll, try and make sure that you have a, you know, another goblin standing up next to it first. Those dodges were incredible. That's some of the dumb shit that you can do with the stunty dodge character. <laughs> it was the final roll that didn't pay off, unfortunately. Uh, chose not to re-roll that one, and I probably would have, because there's not a whole lot of turns left, and you still have four re-rolls on your team. That probably would have worked if you re-rolled it. But unfortunately, the goblins are just overcommitted to one side of the field right now, and I don't think they're going to be able to really get in front of the ball carrier at this point. I think this is going to be a lot of uh, just running around trying to catch the ball carrier and always being one step behind, unfortunately. Camry getting that one hit per turn in. Oh, I stand corrected, actually. I forgot about those goblins back there on the center of the field. Making room for the mummy to go wherever he wants. Looks like we're in range for a touchdown. Unfortunately, this right here isn't really going to stop the touchdown because the ball runner can just go diagonally to the side. And runs in for the corner for the touchdown. And once again, that's on Barry White. Now you can already see that for the Camry, the throw rod starts to become the primary ball carrier. And I imagine when that character levels up, he's probably going to go for a block first. That's ideally what you want on a ball carrier. You know, as has been said many times before, block is one of the strongest skills in the game for multiple reasons. And having it on a ball carrier is no exception. You just have to make sure that when you're making a lot of touchdowns with one character that the rest of your team is not suffering uh, for that one player. You know, if you have all of your skill points stacked on a single player and they go down for whatever reason, you're kind of screwed. Alright, Goblin's playing defense this time. Oh no, they're still receiving, my bad. Another blitz for the Camry. God damn. KO on a goblin here. And already the throw rod is going for the ball. Makes the going for it roll to start right under the ball. 
It's usually unlikely that Kemri are going to catch the ball at any time, but the Thrill Raw... No, the Thrill Raw also has two agility. Thought oh, maybe he had three. Guess not. So probably want a couple players around the, the thrower if they can help it. Just to help catch the ball when it eventually does land. Good use of a blitz. Marked a lot of players. Oh wow, he really did catch it. Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. Fortunate failed dodge roll turnover to the Camry team. Now you got two Goblin players on the throw right now. If the Camry player is op available to, uh, if the Camry player is able to clear those Goblins off, might be potential for a touchdown in the next couple turns here. Already oh, another KO with that mummy. Not a whole lot of injuries, though. Good for the Goblin player, bad for the Camry player. Bashy teams doing what Bashy teams do. Going for hits. Moving around and enveloping. You can see now, because you have this Blitzer standing right here behind these players, it's going to be really difficult for any goblin to kind of come and help. That's exactly what you want to do, too, when you're moving the ball carrier in enemy territory. You want to try and uh, envelop the rest of the team so that they're cut off and they're not able to assist their teammates. And at this point, it seems like it's just going to be another walk-in for the Camry player. Well within reach of the end zone. I don't think the Goblin player is going to be able to get anybody to stop him. Goes for the throw teammate. And yeah, fails the throw. And unfortunately, he goes nowhere. You do suffer penalties when you're making those throws for any tackle zone that you're in. That's something to be aware of. Normally, you want to try. When you do go for a throw teammate, can be a good idea. You just got to make sure that uh, the person making the throw is not being marked in any way. Otherwise, it becomes a lot more difficult. Touchdown number three in the first game for Barry White. What a star player. The Tim Tebow of his day. Does Tim Tebow score touchdowns? I don't know. I don't watch football. Anyway, that's the end of that match. Uh, kind of a rough one. Not very good for uh, the Goblin team that gain any skill points. Got one injury on the Camry team, rest were all touchdowns and MVP, so a good amount of skill points all around there. Uh, but all of them are on the thrower. Most of them are on the thrower. Tommy Lee Bones did get five points, which were well deserved. He's a phenomenal actor. Anyway, like I said, I think the Bombardier definitely would have helped in that match, but there's nothing that really could have been done for that. Um, you know, when you don't have the money to get one, it just, I mean, what do you do? But. Something to think about if you do have to go up against a team like this in the future. Anyway, 
I uh, hope you enjoyed, and I'll be back in the next video with Nurgle versus Dwarves, I believe, which I've been told uh, it should be an interesting match. Alright, see you then.